Hopefully you can all hear me. There's a secret Kit Kat under your chair. No, no, I'm joking, I'm joking, sorry. You'll have to take the break later. But I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about this beautiful brand. And hopefully, I'm not gonna do the same thing to ask to raise your hands if you've never heard of Kit Kat. But we are a global brand, we're delicious. I'm sure you've tried it. If you haven't, you're going to try it. Um, and we've been in the business of making chocolate since 1935 from the UK. But as much as the product is amazing, I think we had a little bit of an issue when it came to our digital presence, right? This was not so long ago. Uh, there's a Google Plus logo there. It stayed until uh, 2020, which is a bit embarrassing, right? And essentially, we were stuck in the past. And we are stuck in the past because we didn't have the right tech, we didn't have the right approach, a lot of silos, a little bit of difficulty getting us off the ground. And what happens when you do that in a global organization is everybody goes everywhere all over the place. So we had markets go everywhere all over the place. Um, we had Tumblr, we had competition, we had a little bit of everything, right? And it didn't look like KitKat. It wasn't KitKat anymore. It wasn't a global brand, uh, the brand that we are. So time for a change. And that's sort of where we started to go. We partnered, and again, partnering is important. You need to work with the experts, right? So with Wonderman Thompson and Acura, we decided we're gonna bring a little bit of order to the madness. We're gonna try and change the way that we grow this brand. Um, because we've been growing well, and it, it, it's not only in store, it's also the way you experience your break online. So we went from Kit Kats that were lost and single into an organized structure, the way you buy the product. So what did we do, and why did we go with Drupal, and why did we go with open source, and why does it matter, right? Why are we here in this room? So fundamentally, um, there is a part for us which is about maximizing our budget. Unfortunately, I cannot say I saved $15 million like Bayer, but there was also millions saved on, on, on our side, right? On really bringing a lot of efficiency, bringing a lot of, well, just essentially less silos, more people talking, and a little bit less confusion within the organization. There's an element of community, right? There's an element of working with people together to build things for the better. Again, if you go back and look at my slides from all the different markets, everybody was going all over the place. So here we work together. And a lot more flexibility, a lot more transparency. We all knew what we were doing. Now we know what we're doing before we didn't, which was a big step for us. And finally, and this is a secret sauce as well, but it took many years in the making, which is it became our company's global standard. And this happens because you have brands going and saying, we want to work in this way. We see the benefits, we want to do it. So KitKat might be a small brand in, in, in essence, but a lot of Nestle now is using this approach and really bringing the scale, the efficiency that a couple of years ago would have seemed a little bit like a mystery. So what did we do, right? I won't talk about the rest of the company, but what did we do at KitKat? So in, until 2020, a little bit of confusion, a little bit of chaos internally. Google Plus was still a link. Um, and then we decided to, to, sp uh, to speed up, right? So we started to go market by market, language by language, just launch this website in a new approach, right? We have consistent look and feel, consistent storytelling. And the most important for us was we could, it's a global brand, we could tell the same story everywhere at a push of a button. This couldn't be done before. You cannot imagine, it's so hard to explain, the pain of telling our, our internal organization, let's please all put the same picture to talk about sustainability. Or let's please all use the same approach. It was really hard, but with this approach that we have over here, we were able to bring this global storytelling and narrative to life. Clearly, I'm on the marketing side, right? But anyways, so it helped actually really transform the business. It helped reset a little bit where we were and start to say, we're gonna do things at a different scale. So, Fundamentally, step one, we broke silos. It wasn't individual markets doing their own thing, individual regions doing their own thing. It was a global community of Kit Catters. I don't know if that's a term, but that's what I'll use. Um, working together and with our partners, bringing something big to the table. Of course, we saved money. It's always an important thing. We were faster, more efficient, nimble. And we increased our KPIs. And who doesn't love KPIs? Who doesn't love numbers, right? But more traffic, less bounce rate, just better, better experience overall for the end consumer. That's today, that's 2023. But we have a lot of plans, right? We really wanna do much more. Something that again, we couldn't do before, but now 
We can have a global promo strategy, which we couldn't do before. We can have better compliance, better security, more recipes. If you've not tried to make a Kit Kat cake, highly recommend it. Um, we can launch content faster in a global way, which our brand is becoming more and more global. Our competition is as well. Um, we're able to have a lot more analytics. I, I, I love, who doesn't, again, like I said, who doesn't love numbers? At a global seat to see who's performing well is always a lot of fun. And we can bring that personalization. Uh, we all know that, you know, Kit Kats are a little bit different. The Japanese have their own amazing products. Um, but again, we can personalize this experience for our consumers there as well. So far, so good, but we're gonna go beyond Kit Kat, because I don't work just for Kit Kat. I work for the beautiful world of chocolate and ice cream. Surprisingly, not putting on too much weight yet. Um, and we're gonna expand this master approach that we have within the organization, this global idea to say, you know, the, the building blocks, we, we, we can reskin them, but let's keep going. Let's keep bringing that efficiency. Let's keep making sure that we don't work in silos. So we can go for more brands like After Eight, we can do more sustainability work on the same architecture. And we can even expand into the ice cream category because the rules of impulse are quite similar. So that's a little bit our, you know, speed running you guys through what we've done so far. Uh, please do buy a Kit Kat after, it would make me very happy. And with that, I'm not gonna bore you much more. I think conversation's more interesting. So have a break, have a Kit Kat, and please join me back. Take a seat. You got a seat. You got in the middle. Yeah, you got in the middle. Thank, you, yeah, you, in the middle. Thank you for sharing your story. I love that you use the Kit Kats as your bullets in your slides. I try, I try. Yeah, <laughs> clever marketing right there. Um, all right, I have a few questions. I'll start with a few questions for you, uh, Arush. Now, obviously, the Kit Kat brand is super strong. Everybody knows Kit Kats. Um, but tell me a little bit more about that. Like, was, did that add some pressure uh, to this effort, or you know? Like such a re, like redoing something for such a big brand. That's not a not a small task. No, can, can I say a secret? Like, Kit Kat's not the same everywhere. Okay. The four fingers not the same. For our colleagues from the U.S., it's not even Nestle. It's Hershey. Tastes different. Sorry, can't do much about it. Um, <laughs> but that what that brought was a lot of pressure to say. Everybody says I'm special. I'm different. My brand has gone here. I've gone here. And fundamentally, in today's world, we know big brands work. We know we need to bring in this consistency. And I think that's important for the consumer. Consumers expect Kit Kat to look like Kit Kat. It's gone. But you know, we all know what it looks like. And yes, there was pressure. But at the same time, we saw a lot of waste, a lot of inefficiency. And when you balance out those two, I think it's a journey. It didn't take a day. How many years did it take? Three years? About. Maybe about three years. Okay. Big project. Yeah. Big project, three-year journey, but we were able to do it today. And today, no one wants to go off by themselves. So it's a, it, it was a fun, fun approach. Yeah. A lot of pressure, but successful. Successful, yeah. Obviously very successful. So, and actually, you mentioned like uh, Kit Kat isn't the same everywhere. And that's a privilege to travel to Japan, for example. And I was surprised they like green Kit Kats. You know, I've never seen that. I actually tasted it. It was delicious. But so tell us a little bit more about sort of like you obviously have one brand, Kit Kat, but then you have these regional differences, like green Kit Kat in Japan, apparently Hershey in the US. So how did you deal with that? Like, how do you, how do you allow that kind of freedom or creative freedom uh, for the different brands around the world? Yeah, I think what we tried to do was the matcha tea green Kit Kat. There have been 400 Kit Kats. Like, you lose count right. after a while, right? But in the end, the way you bring a product to life mm -hmm. And you were showing it before, you know, we have our templates, we have our approach. Mm -hmm. Swap out the product, but the story is always the same. What makes Kit Kat unique is chocolate and wafer. Mm -hmm. We're the only ones. So whether you're a Japanese Kit Kat, whether you are an American Kit Kat or European Kit Kat, you're going to tell that same That's story. Right. Swap out the imagery, mm -hmm. swap out some of the wording, uh, but fundamentally tell the Kit Kat story. Right. And that consistency we were able to bring with our new approach. Right. So it really brought, brought everyone together. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I think that's probably true for a lot of kind of product companies uh, around the world. Um, you mentioned how um, this gave you more agility. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, how, how did it help you accelerate? Well, like I was saying, before we were talking three-year timelines, mm -hmm. right? And I think, who has the patience for three-year timelines, right? So today we can talk much more in six months, four mm -hmm. months, three months, 
even if we really need to rush it within 30 days. Mm -hmm. But that was something that, you know, we're, we're a Swiss company, we're slow, it takes time to get things moving. And over here we were really able to just, it, it was as if we were giving everybody rollerblades instead of walking, right. and we just speed through it. So that, with the flexibility, it's really hard to say no to these kinds of projects and these kinds of savings. Yeah, yeah makes sense. Um, maybe a question for Neil, maybe a question for you as well, but um, talk a little bit more about how Drupal and, and Acqui and the, the open and modular nature of the platform has maybe helped uh, with the implementation side. Go first. As I think speaking about what um, Arish spoke about, it's the, one of the fundamental things that Nestle decided is they standardized across the whole ecosystem, across Drupal, mm -hmm. and that community-driven um, reuse, um, single distribution, which was not just leveraging the global community of Drupal, but Nestle built their own internal one, which allowed them to leverage um, things happening across the entire business. And I must say, that approach allowed us to not start from zero. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke about it earlier, keeping momentum is key. Um, but also contributing back to that Nestle community. So as we were driving um, the more masterized approach, um, but it also drove the user behavior. People were no longer scared of logging into the CMS because everyone was doing it in the same way. Markets were helping each other. Um, and the adoption just accelerated as we went. Yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've met some other large uh, global companies that have standardized on Drupal and Acquia, and some of them actually of their internal Drupal communities. And they have like internal Drupal camps almost, where like all of a sudden, 100 Drupal developers or so from within a single organization come together to share best practices. So it's a great example, I think, of how you can leverage kind of open source and community to, you know, to do great things. Well, I would even add to that point, you know, when we work across the world, 80 plus countries, to have our external partners and That's internal right. partners understand Drupal work because it's open source, you can get into it, right? There are no barriers, there's no, ah, you need to train a lot. That really makes a difference. And then the flexibility of the tool. It just, it, it's the two elements together that I don't think we always have. Mm -hmm. For a company of our size, it's, it just makes sense, right? right. And you'd almost, it, it, you can't go the other way. Mm -hmm. This is the way you want to be, unless you want to end up with Google Plus logos right. in 2022, <laughs> right? Or 2020. You. Yeah, great story. From there, let's actually, you know, you're starting about teams and how teams can work together, but like how has all of this helped sort of team collaboration or cross-team collaboration? Well, maybe I'll go and then I'll, I'll bounce to you, but for me, what, what really changed was, you know, we had markets that would develop things by themselves, amazing solutions for the consumer, you know, great fun ways of bringing KitKat to life online, and then share it with nobody. It was stuck in one, you know, you call Trinidad Tobago and you're like, what have you done? This is great, but could you please share it with someone else? And we couldn't do it because the tech would block us right. or the capabilities of the people mm -hmm. or a mix of, of both. So today, you know, if Germany says, I need this, France usually says, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of internal collaboration where markets at a global level, regional level, local level, talk to each other and brainstorm together, mm -hmm. raise their hands together to say, I need this. That is just, is just a, a, a total shift, yeah. but also, again, I think for global companies like us, but I'm sure all the way down to smaller, smaller players, brings a new level of thinking that you don't have before. Yeah, because everything is open source. There's no limits in how you can share things with other stakeholders, you know, internally, externally. Uh, pretty powerful. Neil, do you yeah. have anything to add I, I, on that? I think what was interesting is one of the key words was collaboration mm -hmm. and community. I think everyone was working on the same tool set. There was also a bit of competition about, I'm going to do with the same amount of tooling that that market did, I'm going to do something better. And it, it drives evolution. It drives the ability for a, a, a healthy competition between markets, looking at how do I do something. And it's adapting everything globally. But we need innovation. We want markets to, to inspire their communities, their consumers. Um, and that leads to each other pushing and pulling forward in the right direction. So that's been really powerful. Yeah, interesting. Very cool. Um, so obviously, it makes a lot of sense to standardize on a single CMS, on a single you know, hosting environment. And you know, I think it's clear to everyone what the advantages are and the savings potentially as well. But when I talk to large organizations like Nestle and many others, sometimes they're like, yeah, makes a lot of sense. The technology is there, it, it kind of works. But the challenge for a lot of these large organizations is like, how do you convince all these brands, right? Because like 
KitKat is just one brand, you have other brands, but then within a brand, you know, you may operate in, I forgot, but like 80 different regions. Like how do you convince all these teams to actually adopt this approach? Yeah. Right? So it's not a technical problem, but like talk a little bit more about sort of the, um, I guess, business problem of getting buy-in. Yeah, and I think to, to you know, it's a, it's a great question. And there's a double, two-pronged approach to it, right? I mean, you have some companies, I don't know how Bayer is, but you know, it's, it's very much like I say you do. Right, right? top-down decision. Top-down, yeah. and th that world must be glorious, because it's not ours. Yeah. Our world is bottom-up. And, and that means that you need to do two things. First, you need partners mm -hmm. that are trusted, that people can rely on, can go talk to and understand. And again, if, if you're talking to closed, siloed worlds, it's just much harder to get into that place. So that, I think, was a one first really big step on mm -hmm. our side. And then secondly, is to have a platform that you can demonstrate. And again, I think your demo was a good approach of doing that, where you, just, you can show what show it looks it. like, show how it works, and explain, like, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. This is why I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Here's some examples of why it's going to work. And once you get those two things, it takes time. Again, coming back to the three-year journey, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you go and you talk to all the people. And when everybody leans in together, there's no straggler. There's no one trying to sabotage you right. from behind or anything. Then the results really click together. But having a powerful, I mean, please chip in on this, but having mm -hmm. a powerful arm and having a powerful partner who says, we know how we're going to bring this to life as well mm -hmm. in a timeline that really works helps just make things easier. And I think one of the key things to getting all these markets and all the different stakeholders involved was involvement, giving them transparency on the journey we're going, taking them along for the drive. Because then it's not take what we've made, it's mm -hmm. let's co-create, let's implement the thing. Mm -hmm. And it makes behavior change and adoption a lot more easy when you've got a bulk number of people that understand their needs are being met. Mm -hmm. And then over and above that, the benefits aren't always explained. It's always about governance. People see you as big brother mm -hmm. um, enforcing it down. Mm -hmm. But a key part of being part of the process is understanding the flexibility you have. And, and, and at the end of the day, there's a money question, right? Mm -hmm. Is what can I spend my money on? Is this going to cost me more? Right. And this model actually allowed budget to be spent more effectively right. at the center and a repurposing of that in the market mm -hmm. for more tactical purposes. Yeah, yeah. I've seen, I've seen the top-down approach. I've seen the bottoms-up approach. <laughs> and uh, the bottoms-up approach can be harder because there's not like a CIO or something that says this is what we're going to do or a CMO that says this is what we're going to do. But very often what I've seen is like sometimes, um, you know, every brand is given a choice. You can either go build something yourself with a vendor of choice or you can use our kind of templated approach, if you will. Um, but what they find is like, you know, like going off and building something themselves can be very expensive relative instead of relative to using kind of the templated approach that's provided. And so um, I've, I've seen a lot of brands opt in just because it makes more economic sense and they actually get a better website as a result of it, you know? But, but that's the thing, like how can you argue? It saves, in the end we always mm -hmm. wanna make sure that the money is going to make cool things for the consumer, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so we save a lot and it just, you know, it just, you can't argue with numbers, especially when it comes right. to dollars, right? But then on the other side, sometimes doing your own thing like you say, it leads to a worse result. Yeah. And then you just, you lose face, right? right. So for us, it's win-win, it's win-win. Right. And exactly. that helps a lot. Yeah, and it's also like organizations that maybe standardize on, on Drupal and Acquia, and then they say, let's do personalization. And all of a sudden, they can add personalization with like one click of a button versus having to go to like some kind of replatforming at that point. <laughs> when, when you have like 100 different CMSs, each CMS has a different personalization solution, right? So. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So uh, maybe a last question, Neil. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the process or how you know you guys approach this at Wunderman and if there's anything that you've learned along the way and that kind of stuff. You know, I think the, the role we played here was quite, was fantastic because I think we had two great partners. Um, when, when it came to the problem we were trying to solve at the end of the day is we were, it was one of the key opportunities where we were part of the process from the beginning. So it wasn't as if we received a brief for a website migration. We were part of the whole journey. So we started at what does digital mean to KitKat? Mm -hmm. um, and the ability to go end to end really makes you feel very passionate about the involvement in that because you take it from 
the beginning to the end, so from the ideation to the delivery. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the, the key parts of this was is we had a client and what they needed and we helped them define. Mm -hmm. And we had a partner um, from a platform perspective and we were very much the connective tissue mm -hmm. in bringing that into reality um, about making sure not only are we realizing the, the goal for today, but also helping define and make sure we're future fit mm -hmm. and that we can actually continue to walk this path with our mm -hmm. client into the future. Um, and I think, I obviously haven't done as well with as a rouge on the Kit Kats. It's, it's paid its toll on me. Right. But I, th I think at the end of the day, it was definitely a, um, a partnership. It was about bringing things together. Um, we played the connective tissue role, but it was a brave client and a vested partner mm -hmm. made this really possible. Yeah, we feel the same way, by the way. Okay. We're Fantastic. lucky to have a great partner. And a, and a great customer. So thank you both. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for sharing your side of the story as well. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to give the floor back to uh, Tom. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.